Thank you all for joining us for the NSF Graduate Research Fellowship Program Workshop. Joining us today is Dr. Andrew Hansen, Dean of the Honors College. He will be discussing the NSF application process and providing tips on how to secure funding from the National Science Foundation uh, Graduate Research Fellowship Program. I'm gonna hand it over to him and he's gonna share his screen with us and begin the presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Navina. So just as a point of reference for um, each of you, um, I am the Dean of the Honors College, but what leads me to uh, leading this uh, presentation is that I'm also a geologist and was a faculty member in the geoscience department here at UNLV since 2000. And in my time at UNLV, I've served on the review panel for this program, the GRFP. I forget how many times, but probably close to seven, maybe eight times now. So I have a lot of experience with how GRFP process works, but it comes from within that discipline um, that's my background, and it will be varied from one discipline to another. So uh, feel free to ask whatever questions you want. I may or may not be able to answer them um, with a definitive answer, but I'll do my best. So as uh, Navina said, I'm going to uh, share my screen. Oh so that uh, we can go through a PowerPoint that I use for this presentation. So um, I, on my side, it looks like I'm sharing the well. I can still see you. Can, can you see my presentation? Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. All right, so as I said, and as Navina said, this is about the Graduate Research Fellowship Program. So this is specifically for students. This is not a, re a funding opportunity for faculty or, or non-students. Um, and I'll explain which students particularly are eligible for the program here in a little bit, but I'd like to make that announcement up front because we've had times in the past where non-students came to the presentation and, and I just want to make sure that everybody knows that. Um, so on the current screen, um, there's a, a, a website listed at the bottom there, that Vimeo.com. Um, this is a link to a Vimeo video that um, one of the program directors that NSF uh, put out last year. Um, I couldn't find a 2020 version to it, and in fact, uh, last year was the only year I remember them sharing this video. So as, as far as I can tell that the content of the video is still current, um, it's, I'm going to cover many of the same things that they covered in the video, but I wanted to share that in case somebody was interested in pursuing other, other pieces of information. Okay, so let's talk about what GRFP is. It's, it's really primarily a fellowship for STEM students, although as you'll see when we get to the eligible fields, um, there are uh, other fields beyond purely just science, technology, engineering, and math that are, that are eligible for this. But for the, for the most part, um, GRFP is, is really aimed at STEM students. And it is a fellowship that supports students who are pursuing graduate education, and it provides them with up to three years of financial support. That financial support is really impressive compared to um, some of the other options that are out there. So students who are awarded a GRFP get $34,000 a year for three years. That $34,000 a year comes as a stipend, a check that goes into your, whatever account you indicate. And it is not required that you use it to pay for, for tuition or textbooks or anything else. You can use that to pay your rent, to pay your food, to pay the gas in your car, your insurance, whatever it is that you have that you need to pay to support your living. This is money that's specifically for that. It's not for your research. It is for you to support you as a student while you are engaged in, in your uh, graduate education. So that's $34,000 a year for three years, plus um, a cost of allowance or cost of education allowance that goes to your university means that the NSF is investing over $100,000 in each student who they award a, a GRFP to. Now that cost of education allowance is $12,000 uh, per year to your university. And because of that level of funding um, and because of the quality of the students who receive these GRFPs, any student who is awarded a GRFP can pretty much write their own ticket for where they want to go. Um, you can imagine that a university that is approached by an applicant 
um, who has this level of support, they are going to welcome you in because you come with funding already in place. In other words, they don't have to pay to support you while you are a student um, in their program. And they also know that the National Science Foundation is paying them to have you as a student. So uh, most students who are supported on GRFPs, in addition to having the $34,000 per year in, in support, um, are, are basically have a free ride to the university they want to go to in almost any university. I've never heard of a student who had a GRFP who was declined admission to a school that they wanted to go to. Schools will want you because you are a free, paid, smart commodity. Okay, and, and as I said, typically you're exempt from paying tuition and fees at the university that you attend. Uh, the due dates change every year, and this year the due dates um, range from October 19th through the 22nd. Uh, there's a range of dates because the date that your application is due will be dependent upon what disciplinary field you're applying from. So you would just need to go on to the, to the GRFP website or the FAST lane, which is NSF's uh, online um, structure, to find out specifically which date within that range your particular discipline um, is, has a deadline for. Um, in 2017, there were over 12,000 applicants and they gave 2,000 awards, which comes out to be about a 15 to 16 percent success rate. That's actually, if, if you want to view that negatively, that means 84 to 85 percent of the people who apply will not be supported. Um, on a positive side, if you were to apply for something like the Rhodes or the Marshall or the Mitchell, the success rate of those is somewhere in the 2 to 5 percent range. And for individuals who go on into, say, academic careers where they want to uh, uh, get NSF support to, to fund their research, the success rate in my particular discipline when I was applying for, these, for faculty awards was typically in the 5% range. So this is actually a relatively high success rate um, if you want to think about it that way. The other thing I'll say in that regard is that for those who do plan on going on to academic careers, one of the things that you will have to do in order to be successful is to develop thick skin and when you submit an application and it gets rejected, your strategy becomes how can I improve this to make it better to become competitive the next time. And if you are the kind of person who applies once and gets rejected and you're devastated, then it's probably not the path that you want to pursue. Now, that data that I showed you is obviously from 2017. I couldn't find any information that's more current. but. They are, NSF has announced that this year they intend to give about uh, 100, or 1,600 um, uh, GRFP awards. I have no idea how many people will apply, so I can't tell you what the success rate likely to be, but it'll probably be similar to previous years. Okay, so it's very important that you consider um, all the eligibility requirements, and so I want to go through those. The first one is non-negotiable, you must be a U.S. citizen or national or permanent resident alien. If you're not, then you shouldn't apply because your application won't, won't even be reviewed. Students who are awarded this uh, support must attend graduate programs here in the United States. You cannot take it and go to another country to get your graduate education. Um, if you are an undergraduate, um, you can only apply when you are a senior. So um, you must graduate by the fall of the fellowship start. So for students who are seniors defined in this case as a student who is finishing their final year of undergraduate in this current academic year, you are eligible and you're, if awarded you would start your, your fellowship in the fall of 2021. For students who are graduate students, it's a bit more, um, you have a, a bit more options. Um, you can apply either in the first year of your graduate program or you can apply in the first part of your second year. But you can have no more than one year and one term of graduate school under your belt. If you've already got more than that, then your eligibility has passed. Um, NSF cares a lot about trying to diversify the science workforce. And um, I don't think I have to tell anyone that in the past, the sciences, the STEM fields were dominated by white and males in the past. And NSF, like many organizations, recognizes the value of diversity. And so there is a, a, pro a bit of a priority given to underrepresented minorities. 
And so the things that, that they deem underrepresented are females, African Americans, Native Americans, veterans, and students with disabilities. In the past, that dis disabilities almost always meant someone who had a physical disability, but that's been expanded in more recent years and we see significantly more students who are applying with, um, with uh, other disabilities. So, for example, somebody might, might um, be uh, someone that is, uh, has bipolar syndrome or disorder. And so, uh, so that's, that, that range of what that entails has expanded a bit. Now, if you have, if you fit one of these categories, great. That uh, does not mean that you will automatically get an award. It simply means that there is a slight preference given to people who, who have one or more of these things. Um, the way that I would describe this is the way that someone described how my application was viewed when I was applying as a faculty member to NSF and I was applying from the state of Nevada. And historically, the state of Nevada has not gotten as much funding from NSF as certain other states. And so there's a program called EPSCORE that is designed to try to increase the funding that goes to states that have traditionally not gotten their fair share. And so I asked, how will being an EPSCORE applicant uh, factor into my application? And what I was told by the NSF director was, uh, we will review your application, it will be ranked with others, and if you and somebody else, else who's applying have uh, fairly similar applications, but theirs might have been ranked just slightly higher than yours, but they are from a state that traditionally has gotten a lot of funding, your application might get bumped up above theirs. So it is something that they're doing to try to increase that diversity, but it's by no means a, a, a ticket to a successful application. You still must submit a really well-written, well-crafted, and well-supported application. And then if you have one of these things, if you're on the borderline, it might be the deciding factor between whether you are in or not. Um, uh, the other things that, that you must have is you must be in a particular field. So obviously engineering, math, and physical sciences, including geoscience, computer, and information, science and engineering, bioscience, social, behavioral, and economic science, education, and human resources are all, all eligible. And the next slide is very busy, but this is the full list of fields that NSF will support. So the ones that are on the left in capital letters are the ones that most awards go to, chemistry, computers, science, engineering, geo, life science, material research, math, physics, and psychology. Um, and then if you are in a in an education field that has to do with STEM, like engineering education or math education, those very much are eligible and, and oftentimes funded when they're a well-written application. There are applications that are supported in the social sciences, and you can see the full list of fields that are covered. Um, I have less experience with what, what uh, constitutes a successful application in one of the social sciences because I'm a physical science kind of guy. And so my experience with GRFP has mainly been on the things that are on, on the left-hand side of the screen. If you are a social scientist and you want to pursue a GRFP funding, then I think it would be very wise to call NSF and to tell them I am a student in, let's say, uh, economics, and I want to know what a student in that field would need to do to have a successful application. They're happy to, to discuss those kinds of things with, with someone. All right, so I'm going to move on now and talk about the actual application itself. And it has multiple parts to it. So there's one part that I would just call the demographic sections, where you'll identify your gender, your race, ethnicity, where you attended at, uh, your, and earned your undergraduate degree, your GPA, where you plan on going to grad school, um, your work and internship history, a listing of the honors and awards that you've received, um, publications and offices held. So this is all just filling in the blanks with your, your, your record and your demographics. I will point out a couple of things here. Um, where you say you want to go for your proposed graduate school matters. You will need to submit an application that is around a particular theme, a plan, a, a, a course of action that you intend to pursue if you're still an undergraduate. And you want to make sure that the graduate school that you're listing 
has strengths in the field that you say you want to pursue. I've seen applications get shot down in the past where I was reviewing where we had a great applicant who said they wanted to do invertebrate paleontology, but they were asking to go into a, a, a school that did not have an invertebrate paleontologist on their staff. They had a vertebrate paleontologist, and those two things are not the same. So that applicant was denied because they named a school that didn't have the specialty that they were interested in pursuing. Under honors and awards, it is important that you list things as uh, appropriately as you can. You should always list them going from the most impressive thing first down to the least impressive thing. Do not do them chronologically. Instead, put most impressive at the top and rank them. The other thing you need to do, which is a common mistake that I see on not just GRFP applications but across the board, is to list an honor or an award by a name that has no meaning to the person reviewing it. In other words, no, almost certainly there's a, a, a very small chance that anybody from the state of Nevada will be on your review panel reviewing your application. And so if you listed something like the Millennium Scholarship, they are not going to know what that means. So you want to list the thing that you, is your honor or award and then very succinctly give them enough information that they can evaluate how prestigious that particular thing is. Another mistake is on the section called publications. Many people assume that that means list your peer-reviewed journal articles. And if you have those, absolutely list those. But publications here can also include abstracts and poster presentations that you submitted that were accepted to a variety of different conferences. Don't overlook things that you did while you were here at UNLV, like if you participated in the Office of Undergraduate Research's annual symposium, that is a publication for the sake of NSF. So be inclusive there. Under Office of Health, this is not a huge deal, but sometimes uh, a person's leadership skills and abilities will be uh, conveyed through the kinds of offices they held. And that can matter in the sense uh, uh, that an app, a reviewer is looking to see, is this somebody who's likely to be successful going on in their career? And people who have leadership skills oftentimes um, are, are more successful than people who have no experience in that. None of these are deal breakers, though, but just be as inclusive as you can. A key part of your application, I, I would say that there's two key parts that you control. The first one is your personal statement. Um, so a personal statement is exactly what it sounds like. It should be something where you introduce who you are, what your interests are, how, what your path has been, and where you are today, and where you want to go in the future. In other words, give us a listing of this is where I come from. This is what, what I've been doing within sciences um, and where I'm trying to go. And that should be a clear, focused narrative. Um, there are some other tips I'll get to about personal statements a little bit later on. I'll talk about that in more detail. The second key part that you control as an applicant is the research proposal. This is a I believe a two-page maximum. One of these is two pages, one of them is three pages, and I never remember which one's which, but you, you only have two to three pages for these two things. Your research proposal should be a well-written proposal. Even if you're if you a graduate student, this should clearly be about what you're doing as a graduate student in the program that you are in. If you are an undergraduate, the reviewers don't expect you to have the same level of uh, specificity and clarity to what you want to do, but you still want to write a research proposal. So in my view, your research proposal should list, uh, should give a bit of background about what the problem is you want to work on. It should list a hypothesis that you want to test. It should list some of the methodology that you will employ to generate data. And then if you've already done some work on that and you have a figure or or something that you can use to, to convey what that research interest you have is, that's great. There's probably going to be a few references at the end of this thing and a summary at the end of it, but it's basically a miniature little research paper that you're writing. Um, you will need to submit a transcript. Um, I'm 99% certain that you can simply include an unofficial transcript for the application. If you're awarded a GRFP, then they would request an official transcript from you at that point. 
all applications require three letters of recommendation. And these should be ideally from three faculty members who best know your research capabilities. So if you've been working in a lab as an undergraduate or in your graduate uh, degree with your, your advisor, one of those letters should come from the head of that, that, that research experience. The more people in this group of three who can talk about your abilities and your history with regards to research, the better. If one of those people, um, if you don't have um, a, a strong two-letter um, of research experience sorts of things, um, you can include other people, but this is not the place to get a letter of recommendation from um, your Boy Scout troop or somebody that you worked with in a community engagement project. These are, are letters that you want to be from science and engineering folks, ideally, people, with, people who know your research skills. Okay, um, there is no endorsement required for this scholarship, um, unlike certain other um, nationally competitive awards that require an endorse, endorsement from the university. No student needs a re, an endorsement. You can simply go on NSF's website, complete the application, and submit it by the deadline, and your application will be considered. Um, so the next thing I want to talk about a little bit about is something that um, is really sort of um, external to your experience as an applicant, but which I will want to explain. All applications are split into different levels. Every student who's applying who is a senior undergraduate is put in a level one group. Every student who is a beginning um, graduate student is put into level two. And level three students are, are rare. They are exceptions to uh, the sort of standard uh, uh, path that most students follow. So like if, you, if a student had gotten, say, a master's degree and then went and worked uh, teaching science for five years in Argentina and is now returning to the United States and wants to get a PhD, that person clearly has a different path than somebody who's either a senior or a first or second year graduate student. So their applications are considered separately. So if that's only germane to you, you don't have to designate what level your application is. NSF will figure out what level you're in. But I point it out because clearly there's a difference in the records that a great undergraduate student might have accumulated versus somebody who's already, say, in their second year of their graduate program. So reviewers read the applications in, sequ in sequence. So reviewers read all of the level one applicants they have, and they rank them based upon how they compare to other students in that level. Then we move on to the next level, and you expect to see a stronger record, a greater application from them, and so you rank those students based on how they compare to other people in that level. Um, and then at the end of this, I'll talk more about how the review process works and what happens to sort of equalize those different levels of backgrounds and experiences that students have in their application. Okay, so for anything that's submitted to National Science Foundation, there are two main criteria that are used to evaluate the application, and that is true for GRFP as well as it is for faculty members who are submitting applications for grant support. The first one of those two criteria is called intellectual merit, and it's much like what it sounds. It's like how what are the credentials of the person who's, who's the applicant? How well uh, developed is this? And so there's a variety of different things that are, are reviewed. So an evaluation of the, of the applicant's ability to plan and conduct research is part of what constitutes intellectual merit. So too is the ability to work independently and in a team. Um, and so those are things that you won't specifically be asked to, apply, to supply in an application necessarily, but if you have experience working on a project independently or in a team, it's wise to mention that in your part of, the, of what you do submit. The ability to interpret and communicate research findings is something that's expected of everyone in STEM fields, and so uh, you know that's where your, your publications and your abstracts and your, your poster presentations and those sorts of things all play into the reviewer's 
assessment of the intellectual merit of the applicant. Uh, obviously, the strength of your academic record is another way that intellectual merit can be assessed. And so your GPA and what courses you took and how well you did in them are potentially all things that are considered. Um, another, my light just went off. I'm going to try to put it back on. Sorry. Okay. So uh, another thing that is evaluated is what's your plan of research. If you are already in a graduate program, um, you know, the expectation is that you will be able to, to submit a research proposal that clearly lays out a well-crafted, well-thought-of, and important um, plan of research. For students who are still undergraduates, um, like, as I said before, the bar is lower for you. Um, a description of what your previous research experiences has been. Um, so that can play, show up in different parts of the application, but that's something that reviewers are looking for. Obviously, your publication and presentation history is a key part in that. Um, your reference letters can speak to your intellectual abilities, in, and that can be an important part of what a reviewer looks at to assess this quality of intellectual merit. The appropriateness of the choice of institution relative to what you plan to do, I've already spoken to that, and hopefully that's clear that you need to have a well-crafted, well-laid-out plan of where you want to go that's appropriate for what you want to do. Um, demonstrated intellectual ability goes without saying. The potential for significant achievements in your area is another thing that reviewers will look at. If a reviewer is comparing two applications and uh, one of them is um, examining the uh, earthquake potential of a large fault in the Los Angeles Basin, and another student is looking at um, the significance of a muscle scar in a clam. Um, I think you could probably assess which one of those has a greater potential for a, some sort of significant achievement. Um, all right, other things is how important is the research? Will it advance our knowledge within that field or across fields? So interdisciplinary research is something that is highly valued. How qualified are you to conduct the project? You shouldn't propose to do something that you clearly do not have the skills to do. Um, and so there are things that reviewers will look at to assess whether you are, are, are prepared to, to take on the thing that you say you want to do. And the letters of recommendation from the people who know you should be able to really support that you are the, you have the chops the, and the knowledge and the skills um, and the creativity and all the things that go into being a great researcher. Um, and, the, and so the reviewers can get that information from a variety of different places. Um, for those of you who are already in STEM research fields, I probably don't have to point out to you that thinking creatively matters tremendously. If you are the kind of person who is used to following a recipe in a cookbook uh, that's not exactly creative, um, it, you might be able to follow certain steps, but when you, in science or engineering, when you run into a problem, it is the creative thinker who can think outside of the box and think about things in a new and different way who's more likely to succeed. So reviewers will be looking for, is this a creative individual? Is this original and transformative uh, work that they're proposing to do? Is the, is the project well conceived and well organized? Um, are there sufficient access to resources? If you say you want to go to University Y and use a supercomputer and University Y does not have that and doesn't have a link to a place that has that kind of access, then that can be viewed as a negative thing. So. Um, Think to the kinds of resources that are at the place you are, are or want to go and make sure that they are in line. If you're planning on having an international component to a project, that's viewed positively because of the, the breadth and the expansion of, of who benefits from the work. Um, but you don't want to do that casually, and so a reviewer will evaluate, want to have a sense of if international activities are proposed. Are they appropriate? Um, is the work that you plan to do or that, or that you are doing transformative? In other words, will it revolutionize uh, your discipline? Will it create a new field? Will it disrupt things that we currently believe to be true? Does it have the potential to change the way we address challenges? So all of those things are, are 
things that reviewers look for in the narratives and in your record to assess the intellectual merit of you as an applicant and the project that you are either doing or proposed to do. The second main category that all NSF things are evaluated on is what we call broader impacts. And I, I'll go through a whole slew of uh, ways in which broader impacts can be conveyed, but the simplest way that I can tell you what broader impacts are is the following. If NSF gives you over $100,000 for the next three years, clearly that will be a great benefit to you. What NSF wants to know when they're trying to assess broader impacts is how else will that $100,000 benefit society? In other words, we know it's going to help you. What is it that you're going to do that will help others? Whatever you can delineate in that regard, that's a broader impact than the specific impact that it will have on you as the individual applicant. Okay, so these are the kind of things that reviewers look for. Does the activity advance discovering and understanding while also promoting teaching, training, and learning? Obviously, when you have a component in a research project that has a teaching, training, and learning component, other people are going to benefit from your, what you're doing in that regard. That's a broader impact. Will the activity broaden participation of underrepresented groups? So I talked earlier about what NSF defines as uh, underrepresented groups, and benefiting something like that is a, is a broader impact. Now that does not mean that you must be one of these minority category people to, to have this be part of what your, your broader impacts are. In other words, if you are a white male, but you say, I have been teaching science at a local high school that is 80% African American, you are providing a broader impact to a targeted uh, group of people that NSF cares about. And that is a broader impact of the support that they are giving you. Okay, other things. Will it enhance the infrastructure at the place that you're attending um, school? In other words, is there some sort of facilities or instruments or networks or partnerships that you will become part of as, because you're supported by NSF? And through that and through these connections, the impact of NSF funding you is spread beyond you. That's, what, that's another broader impact. Will the results be broadly disseminated to enhance scientific or technological understanding? So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go on a bit of a tangent here for a second. Every year when I review applications and I read a personal statement or a research statement, there will be at least a couple students who say, I intend to publish the results of my work in peer-reviewed journal articles. And as a reviewer, if that's all that you get in this regard, you roll your eyes and go, that's not, that's not enough because that is an expectation of anyone doing STEM research. You are expected to do the research but to publish the results. What we want to know is how broadly is the support of you going to be spread out beyond you and the people who read a particular journal article. Other ways that we look at this is what might be the benefit of the proposed activity to society. Now, sometimes this is out of your, out of your hands. I mentioned earlier the scenario between somebody who's studying the earthquake frequency of a major fault in the LA basin. That person's research has the potential to impact 10 million people living in the Los Angeles region. If you're studying the scar of a muscle in a clamshell, that probably doesn't have great broader social implications. Now that does not mean that studying the scar of a, of a clamshell muscle has no value, but you have to, you will, if that's you, you're going to have to have other things in your application that really speak to how that support of you studying that thing is going to benefit other people. Okay, um, I'm going to move on to the next thing, and that is other is keys to success. Um, I, I'm distracted because uh, Nassim is requesting to annotate the shared content. Um, I'm going to come. I'm not sure what that that is, and so I'm going to I'm going to go back to the chat when I'm done with my parts, and hopefully it'll be there. Okay, so keys to success is 
Um, obviously, anyone who's already been doing research and has a record will have a stronger application than someone who has not yet embarked in, in any sort of research endeavor. Um, so that's the more, well, I should say, the stronger your record is there, the better your chances are. Okay, so like I said just now, multiple research things is, is best, um, but there, what I mean by linked is um, you don't want to have multiple random research things that have no connection. Um, a reviewer can rightly lodge a, a, a complaint against that and say, well, this is clearly a student who knew they should be involved in research and so they were just checking the box doing these different things that are disconnected. So the way you can get around that is if that is your scenario is to, is to explain why you chose to participate in the different things that you've done over your career. So I remember one applicant who said, I thought when I began my research career that I wanted to study in this particular area. I did a summer internship and I realized that, that actually my main interest was not in that particular thing but in this associated thing for it. So the second year, I did an internship in that. At, in the course of doing that research, I realized I really needed to beef up my statistical knowledge and so I chose to do this thing the third year. In other words, this student had disparate things, but they, they provided a narrative that made, it, made sense why they were doing those different things. So if you, if you have that kind of record, just make sure that you explain why you, you pursued that path. Giving a poster or a talk at a national meeting is a great thing. If you've only given um, those things at, a, at a, a local thing here at UNLV, by all means include them. But really strong applications are ones where you see a progressive record of sophistication and elevation over the course of the student's engagement in, in STEM disciplines. So ideally, uh, or I'll just say it this way, if you have local things, include them. If you also present it at a regional conference, great. Even better is if you present it at a national meeting or even an international meeting. Um, Things that also matter are internal awards. And what I mean by that is that um, there are funding, ver funding sources um, that are available to students all along the pathway. And so if you've been the kind of student who's applied for those and gotten those, that will strengthen your application. Um, if you have something that comes from outside of your, your current or previous undergraduate institution, that's viewed as even higher profile, and those things are all viewed positively. A strong quality statement is essential. Um, it is really important that you spend adequate time writing your statement and then checking your statement. I will tell you a story I've told many times of a student who I reviewed his application. He was an undergraduate at Princeton. He had a 4.0. He was captain of the lacrosse team. He had been involved in research all four years of his undergraduate. Everything about his record was stellar. And um, I thought for sure this is a student who would, who would get a GRFP award. However, one of my colleagues who reviewed the application said this student had three typos in his personal statement. And if we're going to give $100,000 to a student, I don't want to see three typos in the personal statement. And that student was not awarded a GRFP. One of the takeaways from that is that these are competitive awards, and when reviewers are reviewing them, they, they start to look for reasons to kick somebody out of the pool that they want to fund. So you want to do your work in advance, share it with people who are your friends, and have them point out the mistakes, rather than having the person who's sitting at NSF make the decision, and you don't want to submit things that have mistakes. Those can sabotage you. Um, other things that are great that will really enhance an application is if you've participated in research in your previous project or, or your current projects. In other words, if you are already providing outreach to a museum or to a high school or to any sort of uh, organization outside of your immediate setting, that is engagement in things that have broader impact. And having done those in the past is what you ideally want to have on your record. Um, when I evaluate broader impacts, I sort of have a, an initial three-fold breakdown. 
there are students who, who do not mention anything in their application that is a broader impact, and they have not done anything in the past that's a broader impact. Those students never get awards. The next level is somebody who has maybe not done outreach or those kinds of things in the past, but talks, but, but talks about how they plan to, to start doing that and how they will do that moving forward. That's sort of a middle of the road applica uh, application in that regard. The ones that are gonna float to the top are the ones who say, I've been doing these kinds of things in the work that I've been doing thus far, and my plan moving forward is to continue to do this or to do this in a, in a different way, but I, I am aware that, I, that this is an expectation and I have a plan on how to proceed with that. Uh, leadership roles do matter. I talked about that before. I won't belabor that anymore. Um, the other thing that I will say is each of the two essays that you will have to write, the, the personal statement and the research um, uh, essay, are, are page limited. And, and you absolutely do not want to go over the limit. If on the, on the one that is limited to two pages, if your submission to NSF is two pages and one word more onto the third page, your application will automatically be kicked out. You do not want to be there, pay attention to what the rules are, stick to them. Now, having said that, um, I've seen reviewers be critical of students who didn't use the available page limits that they had. So you don't have to go clear up and fit, you don't want to fill in just for the sake of filling in, but you want to not, if, it, if one of those things is three pages long, you don't want to submit something that's just two pages, because the reviewers will be like, well, where's, where's the rest of the story, if you will? Um, I already mentioned about don't exceeding the space limits. Okay, and then there are some things that you want to avoid if you can that, are, that, are, that cause applications to be less likely to get an award. So students that don't have past research, you have a steep hill to get over. Previous research um, that didn't result in anything, even in abstract, is also something that's viewed negatively. Um, if there's a disconnect between what you've done before and what you're proposing to do in the future, that can be a negative. But if there's a compelling reason why you're switching gears and doing something different, then you want to discuss it so that this becomes less of an issue. Um, most reviewers are looking for a hypothesis and methods. Um, in the engineering or other fields, maybe that's less of an issue, but certainly in the sciences, if you aren't able to state what you're trying to test and what you're trying to, how you're going to use data to, to enhance knowledge, that, that oftentimes is a problem. You need to have a plan that speaks specifically to the broader impacts. So as I said, if the student doesn't include anything and has done nothing in the regard, then their application is not going to get an award. Um, and so a plan of, of what you will do is better. Having past experience with a plan built in is the best. Um, something that can be an issue is being socially awkward. Now, being a geek is a great thing. Um, you should revel in your geekdomness and be as nerdy as you care to be about your science, your discipline, whatever. But that's different than being painfully shy to the point where you cannot stand up and talk in front of a group. As a researcher, you are expected to convey your results to your audience, and if you are painfully shy to the point where you can't do that, that's a problem. And that sometimes will come out. It may not be in anything you submit, but sometimes the letter writers will say, you know, this is a student who really struggles to stand up in front of an audience and present the results of their work. That's a red flag. So if that's you, work on that. All right, if you are a current UNLV undergrad and you want to stay at UNLV, you must present a very compelling reason why. Now, that's not to say that you, that you can't do that, but any student who is asking to stay at the same institution that they were at in the, for their previous degree, for the one that they're either in or they're planning to go to, needs to have a really compelling reason why that university is the best place for you to go. All right, so some other things to consider as you put together a successful application are start early. 
Um, do not wait till the last minute. You want to get your part done, submit it to people, have them review it, have them catch your mistakes. Um, many people, when they're starting this process, will search the internet for resources on how to submit a successful application. I would say that some of that is valuable information, but just be aware that a great application can look very different from one person to another person to another person, and you shouldn't try to follow a rubric or follow somebody else's plan. It needs to be about you and what you plan to do. Frame your application around a particular theme. There is a, an individual who works here at UNLV who um, was an NSF GRFP applicant. It's a student or at the time this was a student who was a female engineering student, and they, for their graduate education, didn't want to continue in engineering but wanted to continue in looking at how to increase female participation in, step, in engineering education. And so that was this student's particular theme was, I was a female undergraduate in engineering, I experienced certain things, I want to study how to how to make things better for students who are going to follow in a similar path to mine. And so there was a theme to that person's application, and that's oftentimes a very wise thing to do. When you write your personal statement, you want to absolutely start with something in your first paragraph that gets the reader's attention. Um, there, the reviewers will read lots and lots of great applications. The ones that really rise up are ones where there's something in that student's background, story, research, whatever, that really catches the reader's attention. Um, and so a, a way I think works well for a personal statement is to start with something that's attention getting that then you can then build your narrative that followed from. Now, if you don't have something, don't force this. But um, I'll give you an example of something that worked incredibly well. I reviewed a student's application who uh, said that he was living in the island of Manhattan. He had lived there his entire life. He had never left the island of Manhattan. He already had my attention because I grew up on a ranch in Montana where you travel long distances and it's no big deal. So the fact that somebody had lived on the island of Manhattan their entire life and never left was like, hmm, that's interesting, that's different. Then he went on to say that there was a blackout that affected the entire East Coast and New York City went black one night while he was living there. And he happened to be outside. And when all the lights went out, he saw a night sky that had obviously always been there, but he never appreciated or even really realized what was there. That also got my attention because I grew up in a place where the Milky Way was a common sight at night. So his personal story was very interesting to me. And he said, I realized that something that had always been there had been hidden from view from me. And now that I saw it, I was intrigued by it. I wanted to understand it. I wanted to know more. And he said, it was that specific thing that made me realize I wanted to be an astrophysicist. He had me right there. That intro was so compelling. And then he went on and said, I went off to this school as an astrophysics major, I did these things over the course of my years as an undergraduate. Now I am applying to graduate school. I absolutely know that this is where I want to spend my career. I want to go to this school and work on this particular aspect of astrophysics. And that student got an award. So st that's what I mean when I say start your essay with a hook. Now I think it works really well to have that hook if you, if you have something that's relevant, that's not made up, it's got to be legit, it's got to be real. If you have a hook that gets the reader's attention, then tell your main story. At the end of your personal statement, refer back to the hook. In other words, so this kid, when he said, I did all these things, his final paragraph had a closing statement that, said, that referred back to, I find it ironic that a, a, an event like a blackout is what shaped my career, but in fact, that is the case. So start with a hook, tell me your story, Remind me of the opening thing that led us into what you just talked about. If you can link your research proposal to your personal statement, that's a smart thing to do. It's not essential, but clearly if you present a coherent story of who you are, what drives you, what motivates you, and then tell me about the, the research things that you're doing and that you plan on continuing to do those, that's, that's a stronger application than if your two things are, not, are disconnected. Um, I've talked about references a bit earlier, but you really want letters from people who can write 
the most about you as an individual with regards to research endeavor. Um, and that's why having a letter from somebody that you've only taken classes with can be okay, but it's not as strong as somebody who can talk about your research experience. NSF wants to fund your research endeavors. So they want to know, do you have discipline? Do you have creativity? Do you have knowledge? Are you able to work with other people? Can you do things on your own? When you run into problems, how did you work around that? Those are things that a great letter writer will include in their narrative about you. Um, and somebody who you've just had two classes from and you got A's in, a letter from them, if that's all it is, isn't much value because the, re the readers are going to have your transcripts. They're going to know what you got in classes anyway. All right, so you absolutely want to follow instructions, and I mean the instructions that uh, NSF gives you. If you're uncertain about something, there's an operations center that you can call, and they're great resources, so take advantage of that. Okay, so that's mainly what I wanted to cover with how the, what the application is and some of the things to be aware of. Um, I, I'm going to spend just a little bit of time on what happens once you hit the submit button. As long as your application meets the criteria and doesn't violate lengths on different things, it will be reviewed. Um, each, panel, each discipline has its own panel, or in most cases, multiple panels of reviewers. Each panel will be assigned a particular set of sub-disciplines within, uh, within your discipline. And um, there will be uh, about 30 applications sent to a particular reviewer in a panel. Each application is reviewed only by three people on that panel. Um, and then um, only certain applications are actually discussed once all the reviewers have submitted their reviews. And it's always the students who are on the border between does this, should this student, is, is this student recommended for funding or is this student recommended for honorable mention? Sometimes there will be discussion of should this student get an honorable mention or not? And, and so there'll be a discussion sort of at, the, at another level lower down. And those are pretty much what the, when the reviewers get together, we do that virtually. When we get together, that's what we're discussing. It's like not who's at the top of the list. Those, those are great students. We're talking about who's on the borderline and should, the, should we bump somebody up or should we bump somebody down? Um, and when we meet with other people who have reviewed the application, it's a brief conversation, no more than seven minutes on any particular application. Um, so the other thing that I will, sh I will talk about is each reviewer is, is required to re rank your application in broader implications and intellectual merit. And we do that on a scale of 0 to 50. So a 100 is an amazing application that ticks all the marks. A 0 means it didn't get above the bar on the ground. Um, so, to, to be a, so just so that you know that there's a, a, a something that, that you might think would be unfair but actually is dealt with appropriately is when I do a review, and I review my 30 applications, I try to give a wide spread in the numerical scores between the ones that I think are really great and the ones that I think are clunkers. Um, somebody else on the review panel might take the same 30 applications and rank them in a much narrower range. So all of the scores are converted to Z scores, which is a way of taking apples and oranges and adjusting them so that your apple range and my apple range are, are, are overlapping. Um, that's something that's out of your control, but it, it, there's a, a level of fairness that's done through that statistical manipulation. So um, I hope many of you will apply. I hope many of you are actually already partway through an application and you're here looking for suggestions on how you can improve your application. Um, even for students who don't get an award, um, Learning the process and going through what NSF is looking for can be a valuable thing. And so I am going to um, stop sharing my screen. And now I'm back where I can see all of the participants in the room and I can see the chat. Uh, when I look at the chat, I don't see any new questions that came up um, since I started talking. I've been talking nonstop. It's now a chance for you to ask any questions that you might have. 
Okay, so someone wrote, I'm currently a, a part-time master's student working full-time. I didn't see an, an eligibility concern, but how successful are part-time students in obtaining a grant? I would say that um, first and foremost that they are they're going to evaluate your record and what you plan to do, but I would say that a student who's going to school full-time would probably be viewed more positively than somebody who's just working um, on a degree part-time. Um, and particularly, somebody who gets an NSF grant would be expected to be uh, uh, going to pursuing their degree full time. Um, so the next question is, how important is GPA, say between a 3.7 and a 3.8? That's a great question, and I I don't have a great answer because it's going to vary from discipline to discipline. Um, GPA does matter, um, especially in obviously that consideration of intellectual merit but it's by no means the guarantee to success or the guarantee for failure. Within my subdiscipline of geoscience, I would say that it's highly unusual for someone with a GPA below a 3.25 to be a recipient. However, if that happens to be a female Native American student who's put together a well thought out project, a lower GPA will be something that's, that's viewed less critically. Um, so GPA does matter, but it's, it's not the end-all, be-all. Um, next thing is I didn't do much research in my undergraduate career, but I have followed, followed the category of a new grad student who's worked in industry and spent time teaching science and engineering to high school students at Title I schools. Would getting letters of recs from project managers and school leadership be appropriate? You know, if you don't have good, strong letter writers who can talk about your research skills, then I think the kind of letter that you're asking about could be appropriate because it certainly would speak to how how you engage in, in things that would be part of the broader impact assessment. So I wouldn't be I wouldn't have a, a I wouldn't view that terribly negatively. I do like to see three letters from people who really can comment on your research skills first. But if but in this case, I would be okay with that. Okay, so I'm a second year PhD grad student. I began my first year as a psych student, but was recently moved to the interdisciplinary neuroscience program, and this is my first semester within that program what I've considered a first or second year student. I would suspect that NSF would consider you as in the start of your second year, um, but it might be worthy, worthwhile to contact NSF and, and ask them. Um, the next question is, do we submit a CV or is all of that information put into the demographic section? So mo you do not submit a CV. Most of what, what you would have on a CV would certainly fit in the demographic section and then um, if there are other things that are on a CV that can fit in um, your the number of applications given to each subset of discipline, chemistry, bio, social science, would a discipline receiving less applications like the social science perhaps have a higher success rate? I really don't, I can't speak to your second question because I don't know how many applications are submitted to different um, subspecialties. I will share this and maybe this starts to speak to your question. So um, my sense is that every year there is a huge number of applications that are from students who are in biology. There's a much smaller number from students who are in geoscience. So in geosciences, typically there's two panels. And so they're sort of split into, you know, linked subdisciplines. In biology, I can only imagine how many different subdisciplines they have. And so um, the, the discipline that you're in and the breadth of, of things that students are doing might vary from discipline to discipline. Because in my subspecialty, or in my discipline, I potentially will see half of the spectrum of what students are doing in the geosciences. In bio, somebody that's a microbiologist might be dealing with a subset of, of applications that are all focused on a particular aspect of microbiology. So I can imagine that, um, that there could be a wider variety of things in the social sciences, but I don't have any, even any knowledge of how many applications they get that are social sciences and what sort of breadth of things there are there. So I, I, I don't really, I can't really comment on that. Can I use work projects? in place of previous research at an academic institution. I recognize SBIR, but I can't remember what that stands for. Um, but I would say that if you don't have 
previous research at an academic institution and you are a graduate student but you've got work experience that involved research, I would want to know about that if I was a reviewer. Oh, small business innovation research. Yeah, so, I mean, obviously, having, when you're, up, when you're in graduate school or applying to graduate school, you're, you're going in, in, down the path of doing academic research um, within your discipline. So the more close your experiences are to that, the stronger it probably is. But if you've done SBIR research and, it, and it's not directly related to what you're planning on doing as you move forward, that still tells the reviewer that you've got certain skills. And I think particularly if you did certain things in that SBIR that um, are translatable to academic research. In other words, if you did um, uh, statistical manipulation of data to, as part of your, your research in industry that's transferable to what you're planning on doing in your graduate uh, research program, then that's a skill that you bring to it. And I would want to know about that if I was a reviewer. All right, so I'm currently working on my master's part-time and plan to, in the future, apply to a full-time PhD program. Would I be considered at the start of my program if I applied at the beginning of my PhD program instead of my master's program? If I understand your question correctly, um, if you are currently, uh, you said you're currently in your master's and then you're planning on going on for a PhD later. I'm fairly certain, although not 100% certain, that your eligibility will be limited to either your first semester in your master's program or your first semester of your second year in your master's program. In other words, you would, you would lose your eligibility for PhD programs by being in a master's program for, the, for presumably two years, if I'm understanding your question correctly. Now, I, I would, I'm questioning that a little bit because as I mentioned um, when I talked about the level one, two, and three at the beginning, um, I can't, rem like uh, that example I gave of somebody who, who got a de degree then went and taught um, science at, at school in Argentina for five years and was coming back, that, that was actually a real application. But I can't remember if that student had only gotten a bachelor's D and then went off to Argentina and was now planning on coming back after a significant break. Um, I suspect, I would refer you to, the, to NSF to really make sure that you know exactly how, what your status would be depending on which way you go there. My gut would tell me that if you are in a master's program and you're going to finish that master's before you go on to a PhD, that your eligibility will, will end at the start of your second year in your master's program. Thank you all for joining us today and everybody have a wonderful rest of your week. Great, thank you very much. Bye everyone.